Hi, it's Connor Svensson here, founder and CEO of Web3 Labs. This is a conversation I had with Daniel Fetchdinger, innovation marketer at Digital Asset. Whilst his current job title may be misleading, Daniel is a technologist and true innovator at heart, having been the co-founder and CTO of Hyperledger, which he started back in 2014. In our conversation, we discussed the early days of Hyperledger and how the blockchain landscape evolved back then. It was mainly about Bitcoin and colored coins as Ethereum hadn't even launched then. We also go into detail about how Hyperledger ended up becoming part of Digital Asset and Digital Asset's DAML platform and his work leading the Interwork Alliance's Interwork framework, an initiative by the Global Blockchain Business Council, which we're both involved in. Given that Daniel has been living and breathing enterprise blockchain for over eight years now, he provides some great perspectives on the space, and I know you'll enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Hey, Daniel, it's great to have you here. Hi, Connor, great to be here. So a number of our listeners have no doubt heard of Hyperledger, which is now a Linux foundation-backed foundation that hosts enterprise-grade blockchain software projects. However, what most people probably don't know is where Hyperledger came from. And it was once upon a time back in 2014, a company that you started with Dano Prey. I'd love to dig into well, what was happening back then and what was it that uh, made it come into being and you know, where it went and how it ended up part of the Linux Foundation? Sure. Uh, yeah, um, there's there's quite a lot to cover there. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, feel free to pull me pull me back in if I go off, off track. But um, yeah, so uh, started. I reached out to, to Dan um, back in early 2014, uh, but it had been germinating in, in my mind, uh, I guess, from 2012, 2013. Um, so go back to, to blockchain in those days, it was all about the altcoins. You know, uh, this is pre-Ethereum uh, uh, mainnet launch. This is, I think, the the, uh, the yellow paper might have been out or something back in those days. Um, there was Bitcoin, but then there was kind of, I guess, across 2013, there was all these altcoins. Uh, it was the era of uh, Litecoin and Dogecoin and all that kind of uh, uh, Cambrian explosion. Um, and uh, that was that was really interesting to me. Um, Dan, uh, I knew uh, going back a long way. Um, uh, we'd been at, at school together, and he, uh, I knew, was interested in in Bitcoin. Um, but I had a particular angle um, that was something I wanted to address. We didn't really have the terminology for it then, but to use today's terminology, um, I really wanted to build. I was most interested in stable coins, um, so not necessarily just pegged to uh, uh, you know one to one to a to a fiat currency, which I guess is the most common form today. But could you take could you build kind of synthetic currencies out of baskets of uh, other currencies or or commodities, um, and uh, really have a platform that you could launch maybe dozens or hundreds of these these different uh, stablecoins? Um, again, today that's that's a really pretty easy sentence to to. Uh, you know, convey some information, but we had no terms for that back in 2014. <laughs> we had to do some long-winded explanations to people. Um, the problem was back back in those days that there wasn't really there wasn't the infrastructure um, and and uh, options uh, in blockchain uh, that you had. Um, it was pretty much uh, you know Bitcoin or variants of Bitcoin. As I say, everything else was uh, very early days. Ripple was around. Uh, it was still, as far as I remember, it was still closed source in those days. Um, so they had an open source that was very centralized. It didn't, documentation was kind of all over the place. Um, it didn't seem, we weren't fully convinced that it was going to be an appropriate kind of building block for us. Um, what we were really interested in, uh, it was Bitcoin had, uh, colored coins and I think, uh, master coins, ways of kind of dropping other types of assets on top of, uh, on top of Bitcoin using yacht returns. But we had, uh, obviously you had, and still do the very long block confirmation times. Um, and our hypothesis was if you wanted to build stable coins, they were gonna have to be like, particularly if they're pegged to something that trades uh, very rapidly, something like, a, that, that something like a, a currency or basket of currencies. If you've got 10 minute block generation times, or you've got an hour that you wanna be waiting before you're sure about blocks, there's a lot of arbitrage Kind of opportunities around that and that it might be too difficult too too um uh too hard to really stabilize a, a currency uh on that 
infrastructure. Obviously today you've got a lot of options for doing that, but as I said, back in those days, we didn't really have anything. So um, that was kind of, that was what we were interested in. A paper popped up by, uh, uh, he's now a Google engineer, I think he was still then, uh, Ben Laurie, um, kind of very well respected in the cryptography space. Um, uh, sort of criticizing some of the design details of, of Bitcoin um, and uh, particularly the kind of the proof of work scheme and pointing out really that just there was this whole field of consensus um, uh, consensus protocols which had been developed in academia and they had good um, uh, you know throughput properties uh, they were very pretty well understood and they had known kind of limits and trade-offs uh, and so that that was kind of the, the technical um, underpinnings, kind of building off that paper. Um, we started to research that and built out um, a very rough alpha and beta. Um, it was at the time, I think, called uh, Mintet, as in a little, a little mint, uh, which was in reference to, to, I think, the Ben Laurie paper. Um, but uh, we, we uh, relatively quickly rebranded to, to Hyperledger. And uh, yeah, so through, through, through 2014, we were, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, we were the first of those, uh, what I guess you'd now call enterprise blockchains. So kind of blockchains without any cryptocurrency built in. Um, we did debate it. Um, you know, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't it uh, was something that we were kind of uh, uh, dead set on right from the beginning, but it just seemed like uh, it was a, an interesting way to kind of uh, differentiate ourselves. Just block, blockchain kind of as a software platform as a software abstraction rather than mixing in the kind of uh, you know game theory economics uh, that you need around the kind of the the, the token uh, uh, asset that you know uh, if you're if you're building something around a native asset um, so yeah I mean broadly uh, I would say through 2014 as I said we launched this alpha launched the beta I would say broadly um, uh, some interest from people. Some people kind of got it and saw it and wanted to build with blockchain stuff. Again, this isn't the industry of today. This was the industry of 2014. It was, uh, and and there was nothing like this at that time. Um, uh, so it was having to go and explain everything from scratch. And a lot of people kind of still, I guess, same dynamics as you see today. A lot of people kind of invested in the kind of speculative side of some of the coins and so didn't understand why we were doing this just as a software abstraction, why we weren't building it on Stellar or Ripple or you know all those other kind of things that were going around then, um, and uh, uh, so yeah, that, kind of bits of traction through 2014. But then I remember very clearly, uh, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, uh, the kind of the the uh, financial banking sector really switched on to to blockchain and the message, and in a matter of weeks, it was just crazy amounts of inbound. Um, you know, uh, from, you know, big top tier banks and financial exchanges and all this kind of stuff, suddenly our message of, uh, you know, there's, this is just a software platform. Uh, this is just kind of building block to build uh, particularly robust systems um, without kind of empowering a new uh, um, uh, central authority um, was very popular. Uh, so we got a lot of interest very, very quickly. Um, and uh, yet yeah, we were in, New York uh, for uh, um, we were we were taking part in I think the uh, I think it was Bank Innovation uh, I think it was something connected to uh, to to Cybos if I remember this is unfortunate <laughs> so many years ago now it's it lost a little bit but we were in this competition I think we had, we went on to win it in the end but we were in New York for one of the regional legs and we um, ended up meeting uh, a small startup uh, called Digital Asset uh, at the time being. Um, uh, based out of, of New York, being led by, um, uh, at the time, Blythe Masters, um, uh, who'd picked up quite a lot of press for the kind of prestige of their investors and uh, uh, Blythe's history as well. Um, we went in for a meeting, which we thought was a kind of a, a sales pitch for them to kind of build their stack using Hyperledger. Um, ended up having getting on really well with the team uh, and really uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Thought there was a, a kind of a good fit there. Uh, really liked kind of what they were building, and uh, you know, candidly, probably quite intimidated as well that you know this was the caliber of people uh, who were uh, going, who are entering the space now. Up until then, it had been quite, uh, you know, 
it was it was kind of the wild west it was crypto days it was kind of a lot of strange characters uh, as it still is but you know seeing kind of real real kind of institutional money and and uh, people with a lot of experience come in uh you know that kind of uh, um made us think that you know that this was a possibly a team worth closely aligning with and one thing led to another and i think uh, you know pretty pretty rapidly um they ended up making an offer to acquire us which we accepted so became part of the digital asset family in about mid 2015 um and uh the uh the the i guess the space that we had created this kind of enterprise blockchain space was still rolling on uh you know it was uh, different projects were launching uh, kind of variations on the hyperledger idea trying out we had a very simple transaction model we were very much built around his assets his transactions um other people were obviously looking at exploring the kind of evm uh you know uh, route um with more uh, uh kind of computation available uh, on the network but still keeping the idea of a kind of permissioned infrastructure underneath it um and uh yeah so we decided we were still in contact with people in the industry and predominantly you know uh, I, I wasn't so involved but dan O'Prey uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting in kind of corralling all those various uh tendrils out in the market and um ended up uh, reaching out with the and speaking to the linux foundation um and we ended up donating the brand um over uh, and other people bunch of people contributed code um you know ibm contributed what they were calling open blockchains probably the biggest uh the biggest chunk uh is now kind of the backbone of fabric uh, although a lot of other contributors since then um so yeah um i've been at digital asset then uh ever since uh, ever since 2015 uh, unfortunately, not so involved in the uh, the, the Hyperledger project anymore, but uh, touch touch in uh, touch base now and again. It's good to see that it's uh, it's still looks like it's going really strong, and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting different projects in incubation there. It's uh, exciting to see, and it's, it's certainly a, a lovely legacy as well to be able to leave there too, with respect to. to having you know that that name was part of the company that you created and you were you were in the space so early on as well compared with most i mean even you know with previous people we've spoken to on this podcast they talk they were people who are looking at this technology you know ahead of the curve from a corporate perspective and that was kind of 2016 2017 and you guys by this point had already you know gone through the journey and, and been acquired and so just uh, going back to the hyperledger foundation was at that when it was first created, and this is more of a kind of curiosity point. Did you have the Linux Foundations and IBM saying, "Hey, we want to create somewhere to, for blockchain projects," and but it needs a name, or was it more that those like digital asset came along to these guys and said, "Hey, we've got this great idea for you know we've got some open source we want to throw into the mix," and IBM obviously, as you said, were keen to as well. Um, I think it's. Uh, I, I don't know if I can speak authoritatively on this. I think uh, uh, you know it was really uh, Dan O'Prey on our side, at least, who was who was doing a lot of the um, a lot of the work here. Um, I I I I don't exactly know how it came together. You know, um, I think it was. Um, uh, I, I think we'd ended up with the situation kind of having uh, acquired. Um, you know, when when Digital Asset ended up acquiring Hyperledger, um, ended up with a. a at, at the time, uh, you know, we wanted to be neutral to the uh, particular underlying platforms that we were supporting and to reuse Hyperledger as a brand, I think, would have sent uh, slightly the wrong signal that, that perhaps we were, um, uh, you know, competitive or launching our own thing. I think it would have it, it didn't really fit in uh, branding wise into kind of into what we were building with digital asset. Um, but it had it, it did have a lot of cachet in the in the in the kind of the marketplace. Um, we'd we'd built a lot of credibility there. So um, I don't know exactly whose idea it was, but I think it was a relatively simple decision when it was offered. Um, I think it was a, a kind of a no brainer um, for the for the foundation to take it, and I'm glad they did. Yeah, it was always something that Dan and I wanted that we were gonna hopefully one day. Obviously, our what our mental model was back then was very different from what ended up being the case, but. Uh, at least something that was going to standardize around the protocol level uh, and have that in a really kind of, you know, open, openly governed uh, foundation uh, and allow for different different implementations of it. 
um, but yeah, couldn't couldn't have imagined something as as large and vibrant as the the current Hyperledger ecosystem. So really glad it's uh, it's uh, still going there. Yeah, and it's definitely one of those things that you know, I'm I'm no doubt assuming that you fall into that camp. But as as technical folk, you kind of aspire to having code and software that can be open, and there's play you know people can collaborate on it as well. Um, you know, there's the commercial interests, of course, but then it's nice when there's those opportunities to kind of give back to the wider community, albeit the technical community. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a natural place for it, right? It's it's. Um... This is, uh, you know, hopefully the kind of the, the way it's heading going to be a uh, relatively core part of a lot of financial infrastructure. And it's not a level at which you want proprietary protocols and, you know, things that are locked up really tight. Um, it's it's it was always going to have to be a, a like an open source layer. So um, but there's there's a difference between kind of just open sourcing something. Right. Just just we were always building open source. Right. We just had a GitHub up and, you know, we, we were dropping all our code there. But there was no governance to it. There was there was nothing beyond that, and that's really what the Linux Foundation specialise in. You know, they have decades of experience now uh, marshalling some of the biggest software project, open source software projects. So, being able to plug into uh, their kind of governance models, legal models, all that kind of stuff, um, and particularly, you know, under the early uh, stewardship of um, uh, Brian Bellendorf. Um, who was, you know, at the time, I think executive director, I think, or something, but leading leading the Hyperledger Foundation, had a lot of experience coming from the Apache Foundation um, to really kind of shepherd all these these projects forward. Um, so yeah, as I say, it's it's not kind of uh, uh, it's interesting to see, you know, touching touching into it, it's kind of you know, I, there was a time when it looked quite kind of familiar to me. I was like, oh, I kind of recognise all the pieces there, and now it's this kind of big greenhouse. I think they call it of all these kind of projects they're incubating and. Uh, yeah, it's just interesting to see the breadth of uh, uh, solutions that people are building in this space. Absolutely. And so moving on to digital assets, DAML is one of the, I guess, one of the core products of digital assets. And their approach by you know, creating that library is kind of different to many other platforms insofar as they've created, in effect, a ledger agnostic language for designing smart contracts and multi performing multi-purpose computations uh we, would you be able to just tell us a bit more about um you know what what it is about daml and that sort of approach that's always sort of appealed to you because it's, it's something that they, they didn't obviously start off there but um it, it's been something that they've been doing now for a number of years and it's kind of one of the core the core offers there um of it sure so i mean I going right back you know we didn't have when we joined digital asset um it didn't have uh i'm trying to think 2015 i, I still think this was pre you possibly remember better than i do pre main let main net ethereum launch uh i think that was slightly later in 2015 um and this this idea of kind of smart contracts was floating around you know the, the ethereum white paper had been published and um People were obviously talking about it. I remember there was still a lot of chat about like how much you could fit into an 80 byte op return uh, code on Bitcoin. You know, was that going to be scalable? Was Ethereum really going to offer that much, uh, uh, you know, on top or was it just an over engineered solution? Uh, so these were, you know, going back, it was, it was a very early time and it wasn't exactly clear as to what, how much uh, on chain logic uh, you were really going to need versus um you know just using the blockchain kind of as a commitment mechanism which still is a pattern you see today people just kind of doing off-chain transactions hashing them or hashing well-known states or documents or whatever it is and just committing them to something like like bitcoin um these these were really early you know it's really early um very early kind of technical um uh questions and uh our particular focus, given our given our kind of origins and our work with um, kind of systemically important financial institutions, market infrastructures, um, banks, and other things like that, has always been privacy. Uh, so that's kind of been, I think, from the early days, a lot of the architectural decisions that we were making was really that was kind of the. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of others that we wanted within the systems to be reliable and robust and scalable and all these you know obvious things, but privacy was the one that was the biggest challenge because it's kind of in contention with the consensus protocols where you need to 
federate out, you need to, you know, gossip out a lot of data and, you know, get a lot of nodes to kind of agree to it and kind of, you know, go through whatever consensus mechanism it is, proof of work or um, uh, 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 more traditional kind of consensus protocol. Um, and so there, there is a tension there. And I think that was um, uh, one of the guiding things that, that kind of ended up culminating in DAML. Uh, so the origins of the language were actually in a, um, a Swiss company called Elevance that was acquired by Digital Asset in 2016. Um, and they had been building this programming language for finance. Um, and uh, it um, lacked, uh, I would say they were building it kind of from the top down, from the language, kind of how are you going to describe all these like very complicated financial contracts? And, uh, you know, they, they had... Uh, they hadn't yet got down to the the level of kind of building out the infrastructure around it, kind of connecting it to blockchains or, um, you know, figuring out kind of integrations into other systems and stuff. And Digital Asset at that time had been going uh, a little bit differently. We'd been building um, infrastructure, um, you know, all the kind of the various pieces, a lot of hard coded stuff at that time, because again, we were still using the blockchain as kind of a bit of a, um, uh, you know, sort of a, because we wanted to be so private, we weren't kind of contributing too much logic. Uh, uh, on-chain. Um, so it was a lot of kind of off-chain stuff and then kind of making commitments uh, onto the chain. Um, but we were realizing the kind of the fragility of that approach, uh, not having uh, on-chain uh, smart contracts was uh, certainly becoming a sticking point. We wanted to add new asset classes or something that's kind of, you know, whole new blockchains and compatible things. And it was raising a lot of questions. So um, the, the acquisition uh, really kind of, you know, uh, I think, uh, was uh, very nicely dovetailed the kind of the two approaches um, and again coming in with our kind of the, the privacy focus was was uh, so essential and um, you know the DAML's approach that we kind of that you know as the teams were kind of meshing together and figuring out how we're going to kind of square all the, the various kind of technical artifacts and how we we're going to um, particularly with the minds that we had to solve all of this with privacy as well um, I think it was it was um, uh, you know, this, this very elegant solution kind of fell out. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, a you know, uh, it's a very interesting language. I encourage anyone to, to go and take a look at its open source. Um, uh, you can, uh, download it at daml.com and, uh, it's, it's kind of a Haskell inspired language. Uh, so it's a, a functional language. Uh, it's got a strong static type system. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty approachable. Uh, I've got a lot of um, uh, developers who are kind of, you know, very focused on the developer ergonomics of it. Um, so it's uh, a, a, a really nice language, I think, to, to write, because uh, fundamentally what you're trying to write, smart contracts can get very complicated. There can be a lot of uh, sophisticated pieces uh, in financial models, financial workflows. And so, you know, you don't really want the language to get in the way uh, of, of trying to express a business problem like that. Um, and particularly, I think the most important thing and kind of really what I think differentiates it from, from something like Solidity, which is a great language, you know, Solidity is, um, uh, I think does some stuff really nicely, but fundamentally very different execution models. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we ended up going the DAML route and not the kind of the Solidity route, which was floating around back in 2015 was that we didn't see any way to add what we needed privacy wise. Uh, into the kind of the EVM execution model, uh, that model of kind of contracts as objects with messages flying between them, um, didn't didn't lend itself to the kinds of privacy that we needed. Um, and so, DAML fundamentally under the hood, this isn't necessarily something you're thinking about as as you're programming it, but it's um, it's a bit more uh, like the Bitcoin system. It's a bit more of a graph of transactions with states getting created and and kind of consumed over time, uh, kind of like the input output model of Bitcoin. Um, and what that means is that then you can reveal just kind of very select parts of the graph uh, to, uh, to say, a stakeholder to a transaction. So um, it's just a bit more fine grained on, on the privacy aspects. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been interesting to see the kind of the different development paths because obviously Solidity has got a slightly different focus and uh, um, some really interesting tooling around it, really interesting um, uh, applications being built in it. But, it's kind of two two different tools solving two different types of problems. So uh, it's good, I think, that the industry has kind of got multiple uh, solutions there. Uh, depending on, there's nothing nothing worse than, you know, only having one tool in the toolbox and 
trying to use that to solve every particular, every class of problem, even when the problems fundamentally have kind of different attributes. And that, that was something certainly that struck me back in the, uh, a few years ago, I'd hung out in some of the functional programming communities before and uh, seen, you know, got, got to know some of the faces and suddenly started seeing a lot of these people turning up at Digital Asset. Uh, working on on Daml, and so it was, it was clear that yeah, you, you guys were hoovering up a lot of really good talent there in, in order to actually build out the uh, the platform there. So it's yeah, it's, no, no doubt has had some really got some really solid engineering behind the scenes there. Um, just touching as well, I, I, you know, a lot's changed right since twenty fifteen, and now nowadays we have these these things like you know, zero knowledge proofs and you know roll ups and these various other you know, privacy approaches. Do you, do you think that if we were you know where we are now back in twenty fifteen, it it could have changed the path that uh, you guys took? I appreciate it's something that you you know didn't necessarily decide for digital asset, but I think more as a kind of thought experiment because certainly where we are six years later, the landscape is very different to where we were back in 2015. Oh, yeah. I mean, if we had some of the things available to us uh, back in back in 2015, I think we would have made a completely different set of decisions. I think it's every kind of, you know, engineering technical decision like that is going to be situated in, in the kind of the current context of what's possible. Um, one thing, I mean, I'll say, you know, we were always very, one of our, our founders, our, you know, founding CTO, um, Shal Kafir was, uh, you know, he was one of the, I think he was the, uh, the, the lead on, um, the, the Libsyn Arc project, um, uh, prior to digital asset. So, uh, a lot of kind of experience in zero knowledge proofs and it's something that and just to take that as, you know, one of the examples that you mentioned is something that we've always kind of kept a, um, a close eye on. And we certainly have lots of ideas about how, uh, and you know, when that could be, uh, how that could come to bear on kind of the, the technical architectures that we're building. Um, the the trade-off has always been the interesting thing to me, uh, perhaps coming from a bit more of a, um, you know, a software startup uh, world where you're kind of, um, you know, you're building and managing your own services and you're just using it, whatever the, the kind of, you know, the most appropriate thing, even if it's something cutting edge or a bit, uh, um, you know, uh, a bit rough around the edges, but you know, you're taking on that risk yourself, but trying to build out infrastructure for financial institutions, you have to maybe make a slightly different set of trade-offs. And so you maybe naturally have to sit behind the curve a little bit. Um, and probably wisely. So, you know, there's been some, just to take an example, you know, um, uh, the, uh, Intel's, uh, secure enclave, uh, stuff, um, uh, is it SGX. Um, uh, momentarily forgetting the name uh, yeah, it's got some yes. interesting possibilities but uh you know again something we looked at and kind of you know have a have a, a stance on and very aware of kind of what it can do but uh at the same time there's kind of you know periodically been some pretty major um issues found with it uh and so sitting a little bit behind uh, on some of this stuff can be um uh, a wise strategy uh, as well um, particularly not making a too aggressive a commitment to it. So I think just from an engineering point as well, you end up with something that's, uh, that's, that's quite robust. Um, you know, you're using very well understood primitives, uh, particularly in something like cryptography, which can be a, um, uh, you know, where you can really shoot yourself in the foot if you, if you go off the beaten path, then, you know, you, you're, you're opening yourself up to a lot of, a lot of, uh, potential problems. Um, and so if you just stick to the kind of best practices and very simple primitives, um, and, you know, build with that in mind, you're going to end up probably with a very kind of simple, robust core. And then you can focus on, you know, the real kind of 90% of the engineering work being, the, the, the production readiness of it, the scalability, the monitoring, alerting, the plugging it into different, you know, uh, platforms and, uh, you know, all this container stuff has obviously exploded over the last few years as well. And that's what people are kind of expecting to use. So, you know, there's all these kind of like engineering concerns on top of just the, the, the core technology pieces. Um, so I think that that's, um, Yes, we would have built things differently uh, if the world, you know, was today what it, uh, you know, if, if we had back in 2015, some of what we've got today. Um, 
but at the same time, I think maybe the bulk of it would, would, wouldn't have looked too different because, uh, you know, it would have given us a leg up, but I think where we've ended up is, is in a space where, um, uh, our architecture makes is, is appropriate. makes sense for the solutions that we're trying to solve. So unless we were solving a different problem, I think the architecture wouldn't look too, too dramatically different. Yeah, absolutely. And so what, what are some of the other initiatives that Digital Asset is focused on? Because that DAML is just, you know, it's a, it's a key product, but it's one of the you know key products that uh, Digital Asset uh, provides. Yeah, so we're an enterprise uh, software company. So that is, uh, DAML is a kind of our core. Um, it started off as the, it was just the language. Uh, and I guess I've been speaking about it as a language, but you quickly realize it's, it's, uh, uh, these things don't don't always quite work. So it's really, if you think about it, Daml is a is a runtime platform. So it sits on top of uh, different storage backends, whether that's a, a blockchain or a traditional centralized database. Um, and it has a runtime kind of data model, the ledger uh, that it's building. And obviously, the the shape of that ledger, the schema of that ledger, if you will, is kind of determined by the Daml models that you're loading up. Um, and uh, so, really, that's the kind of it's it's a a platform um, for building, running, executing these uh, multi-body applications, kind of smart contract based uh, applications. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have then uh, uh, a couple of, um, uh, the, the, the core of it's open source, you can grab it, download it, run it yourself. Um, but uh, enterprises typically want a little bit more than that. Um, and so we have uh, enterprise packages available um, with Kind of, you know, uh, additional enterprise features and things like enterprise support, which come along with it. Um, and we also have a managed service uh, called uh, Daml Hub, um, which is uh, for, for, for many people, they want the kind of the benefits of being able to build. Uh, it's kind of like the, the kind of blockchain as a service kind of uh, pieces, um, but a little bit different. Uh, we're focused kind of really just on the application layer. So um, the idea is you're not building in a kind of very low trust environment where you need the kind of the blockchain consistency tamper proof kind of properties you just want the benefits of being able to work in a multi-party kind of application using a smart contract language which is built for writing financial workflows or uh, you know trade workflows these kind of things um, you really realize that you can can get a real speed benefit building your application using the appropriate tools uh, so yeah we've got this managed solution as well which is uh, um, a, a rapid way of building and, and deploying these applications And, and certainly one of the things that seems to have come up before too is the the flexibility of the back ends is quite a powerful thing because some organizations although they start off thinking they want to work with blockchain then uh, they they start they, they they come across some of the um most ledger based uh database technologies like the uh, aws um the qldb a a aws is uh, yeah, Q QLDB, Microsoft have recently released uh, a similar blockchain-backed uh, SQL server, basically. And uh, that, that sort of flexibility, no doubt, is of great appeal to certain organizations for certain classes of problems. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that was one of the things, uh, again, that we would probably have taken. Uh, that's that's probably something that, that would, a lesson that we would, I would like to feed back to my 2015 uh, era self, um, we were so focused back in those days on uh, the kind of the, the consensus protocols and this, you know, how do you build very trusted uh, systems out of kind of lots of loosely, you know, perhaps mutually distrustful um, uh, uh, parties running each of their own nodes, because that seemed to be a, a key piece of the kind of Bitcoin uh, blockchain story. Um, and it certainly is. Um, but there's kind of two levels. There's the infrastructure layer, which is how can we build these uh, these blockchains, these kind of, um, I think of them as databases now. I didn't like it for a while, but now I do. I say, how can we build these very kind of decentralized databases um, and but, but still build them in a trusted way, even if they're built out of lots of kind of uh, um, uh, little kind of non-cooperating, loosely cooperating parts. Um, and then there's the kind of the application level, like the smart contracts and building building with that and uh, um, the, the types of interfaces, things like the ecosystems that you can unlock with like ERC-20 or ERC-721. Uh, uh, you know, that's a kind of a whole separate level. That's kind of just like engineering things. How can we how can we build a service? How can multiple people just throw code into a service and build, you know, this whole ecosystem, which isn't just going to constantly collapse on itself? 
Um, and that's kind of a separate question. That's kind of a building at the application level. Um, and so I think, you know, when you kind of decouple them, you realize, okay, so we've got this kind of this, this, uh, uh, this way of building very highly trusted uh, databases, highly trusted machines that are still very decentralized. Uh, that's really interesting. And then we've got a way which is building uh, really easily these kind of multi-party applications where a bunch of people can just upload new logic to it, uh, new smart, smart contracts and, and kind of constantly enrich this service. Uh, as an ecosystem and if you decouple them then you realize okay well we can actually run yeah it makes sense to run the the, the multi-party applications on top of highly trusted networks sometimes but less slow and uh, you know there's overheads uh, a lot of overheads when you deal with them and in some cases we just want the benefits of, of building that kind of uh, code ecosystem smart contract ecosystem uh, and we can just run it on a you know we can just empower a central party to just run this infrastructure uh, so I think it's it's being able to take your, uh, you know, being able to take the benefits of those applications and just deploy them to whatever, whatever infrastructure makes most sense for you. Um, because even within that category, right, you get different of the, say, the blockchain technologies, you get different, um, you know, permissioned or permissionless infrastructure. And um, within those, you get different throughput rates. You know, there's different technologies, different trade-offs, different privacy models. Um, and so if you kind of tightly couple all the way up and down the stack, then you're just, it's as an industry, you're not going to move very far because everything that you do, you know, imagine if you had to, you know, pick your programming language and that also determined what kind of CPU you were kind of committing to run on in production. It would just be a, you know, nothing would ever move anywhere. You know, if you wanted to change language and then you had to rip out your data center or change your cloud host to use a different type of CPU. It would just be too tightly coupled. So being able to, you know, separate the two pieces and run applications as you want is a um, uh, where you want them uh, I think is a is a very good in, uh, way to kind of ensure that the kind of uh, you know the industry can kind of keep building the solutions that it needs to uh, and and keep making technical progress as well yeah we certainly don't want to be back back in that place you were with C and C++ where you're, you're compiling it for certain target architectures <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. Now, the, the downside, of course, or the so, thing that the next piece go. that you need to solve there is uh, how do you end up? Uh, um, obviously, then you've kind of got you, you're, you're just kind of changing, you're just building different islands, right? So the idea is that we want to get rid of all these different silos and kind of build around blockchain architectures so that people can build these kind of these interesting multi party applications where you're not you've not just got little silos of data and little kind of uh, narrow um, uh, bandwidth interfaces kind of just in and out of them. You're actually building like full fidelity models uh, that anyone can kind of contribute code to and, uh, as I say, kind of end up in this collaborative process. But I think where the industry is currently kind of uh, is, is kind of at the moment, we've left open the problem that we're we're just building bigger silos, bigger islands. We've got all these kind of proliferation of um, uh, uh, enterprise blockchains, even public blockchains. Um, there's a there's a lot of them, uh, and they're not all kind of uh, you know there's there's some interesting efforts to kind of make them slightly interoperable, but I really think that's going to be if I'm looking ahead to kind of the next era of of uh, this blockchain technology, I think that's going to be something that really needs a lot of work uh, because right now I think it's it's kind of holding back the the you know the the ecosystem as a whole. If everything that you're deploying to is going to be you know, uh, stuck in in to to just committing to one instance of a particular blockchain network. I was trying to find out the other day. You know, how many different deployments of something like Fabric are there? Even a loose kind of estimate, and I I I couldn't see. You know, how many different Fabric blockchains are there out in the wild? I mean, maybe IBM have done some research on that, but I couldn't find any kind of public information about you know what people thought. But um, uh, back of the, the napkin calculations, I reckon it's thousands, tens of thousands. Um, and that's a lot of different infrastructure, which uh, I think is going to need some uh, some protocols, some infrastructure, whatever it might be, to really make sure that those are interconnected, uh, not just uh, that they are, that they work nicely within themselves. Yeah, and there's certainly interesting things happening in the public domain with Ethereum in that respect because of all these other protocols are starting to promote Ethereum, well, EVM support, basically, so people can run Ethereum contracts natively on them. And so whether that ends up being a de facto standard for public blockchains certainly remains to be seen. But it's 
it's certainly a, a fascinating time with um, you know more and more blockchains coming forward to say yeah we support these these contracts yep yeah um, even more so, than yeah sorry yeah you go no no go on go on yeah i was, I was just going to say like even even beyond the kind of the uh EVM piece is, is, you know, good, uh, absolutely, that we can kind of have these, these, the same execution semantics across different blockchains. But I think even stronger than that, we want some way of kind of synchronizing the actual runtime state of, of different blockchains. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a few things out there. There's kind of different, obviously, you know, Cosmos and um, uh, it's since blockchain protocol and stuff like that um, is out there. Um, I think it's... Uh, uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there, uh, and we're hoping in the new year that, that uh, with Digital Asset we might be uh, we'll, we'll be publishing a little something in this space, so that uh, we've been we've been working on. Hopefully, going to help kind of move the whole industry forward there as well. Cool, that'd be ex exciting to see when that comes out. So, what, one of the other things that uh, you're involved in, and this is certainly something that the two of us have spoken about a fair bit over the last 18 months, is the Interwork Alliance, which is obviously now part of the Global Blockchain Business Council. Uh, but you, you are the chair of the Interwork Framework Working Group, and I'm obviously the vice chair there. But what what was it about the goals of the Interwork Alliance um, that kind of you know pulled you in? And certainly for our listeners, the Interwork Alliance is a really a standards body that's focused on creating standards for multi-party compute type business scenarios and um, the interwork framework is the part that's focused on smart contracts or you know whatever you want to call them yeah so i mean it's uh i guess there's there's kind of there's two angles to it so firstly the the um interwork alliance had, had some previous form uh, in the, one of the kind of uh, uh, precursor elements into it was the uh, the uh, token taxonomy. Um, I think it was the token taxonomy initiative became the token taxonomy framework, um, which was uh, uh, you know a very comprehensive effort to take this kind of Cambrian explosion of different tokens and different types of tokens and definitions to try and kind of build a, uh, 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 a specification or a framework that could. Um, very simply kind of explain the core elements of tokens that so you could kind of have a common language to talk about all tokens and then a very precise way of specifying, but I mean specifically a non-fungible token, which, you know, of which there is a fixed supply and, you know, uh, they can only be transferred five times or something, you know, the, adding on these kind of modifiers, but still having a kind of a common language being able to talk about it. Um, so the question is really, how do you take, given the, the kind of a, a plethora of tokens, how do you kind of apply a similar um, uh, approach to the next layer up, the smart contracts, if you will, or multi-party applications, whatever it is that's governing the, the tokens in these movements. Um, and, uh, you know, another piece just kind of as the, the kind of um, uh, motivation was written was uh, to try and avoid, I think something you touched on earlier, which was how do you stop, uh, what, what quite a lot of companies have found themselves doing is picking a particular blockchain architecture first, uh, perhaps because you have vendor relationships and so you know you pick a particular uh, uh, platform uh, and then find out it has certain properties certain limitations or certain benefits or you know it does one thing and not another um, and but you've already committed to it you've started your business process of kind of you know um, uh, uh, specifying the problem that you want to solve but finding that it's somewhat incompatible with the technology or letting the technology you know modifying your solution to a suboptimal solution so as to fit the technology that you've kind of pre-committed to um, and so if we can kind of reverse that and say okay we want to talk we want to be able to talk about kind of general properties of smart contracts and multi-party applications and kind of have a way similar to the token taxonomy framework of being able to describe the properties of what we need out of uh, a particular uh, uh, to solve the particular problem that we, the the authors, the developers need to solve, the business needs to solve, uh, and then we can kind of then we kind of have a, a rigorous way of understanding: do the technology platforms we have available to us make sense or not? You know, how can we kind of help guide that decision? So, I think that's something that we very often found uh, at Digital Asset. You know, uh, we we deal with a lot of companies who come to us having 
started down one particular path and then realizing that they they kind of need to back out which is why one of the, the good things about daml is that it's portable so you know you can kind of keep the uh uh the properties that you that you that you need from the language level but then you know pick the infrastructure that you perhaps have already committed to you perhaps have operational experience deploying um so that's something that we're very familiar with at digital asset and something that we were we're really hoping to kind of standardize the spread uh, across the industry at large beyond just a you know our particular vendor solution there yeah so it's certainly be good uh, as as seeing those goals fulfilled uh, over the coming years yeah and it's certainly i do remember first seeing the charter and kind of the scope of what the iwa wanted to achieve there and thinking you know this is uh this is ambitious this is really uh this is really far out um but um you know i think it's the sort of problem that we're we're chipping away at and uh you know uh, first thing that you know you and i did sat down for a, a kind of a, a few weeks a few months and just really sort of figured out you know what's the art of the possible what what today without inventing anything you know what what are the ways that we can kind of talk about this and and uh um reasonably in a way that would cover both something like daml and something like solidity and some of the other languages out there um without kind of uh you know dropping too much information how can we kind of describe all these things consistently um uh but acknowledging that they do have differences yeah absolutely long way to go so <laughs> more work yeah do. exactly <laughs> so it's going to keep, keep us busy for years to come <laughs> so if, uh, if if people want to kind of keep keep up to date with what you're up to or you know engage with anything you know wh wh where you're present online or whatever else well, what are kind of the best channels to reach you you've obviously mentioned digital assets as the company there and their website and where, where damel's found but uh, what, what about yourself if people want to contact you um, yeah, I mean, pretty much, um, Twitter is, is, uh, the, the backbone of my <laughs> web presence communication. Uh, so you can check me out. My, uh, my handles, auxilit, uh, A-U-X, A-U-X, I-L-I-T. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I tweet some blockchain stuff these days, but it's, uh, kind of tech at large. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can always reach me there um drop me a dm if you if you want to get in touch oh awesome well daniel it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to host you and uh well obviously we will be continuing to talk over the coming months but i'm, I'm sure our listeners were you know, fascinated to hear about what you've been doing uh, this this past uh, six, six or so years in the world of blockchain great thanks for having me it was a real pleasure